you could see on agenda that our next speaker is Admir Mašić. He's Associate Professor of Civil and Environmental Engineering at MIT. And he will tell us more about building resilience in humans and materials. Why he sent us a video? Because currently he is in Kenya. And you can guess, he can't connect to internet. He wanted to join us on QA session, but he's in Kenya. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, we will learn more about we are aware of the fact that lifespan of humans as well of materials is limited. And through his life, our speaker and professor at MIT has witnessed destruction of both things and people. In this talk, well, video, Admir will combine his personal story as a Bosnian war refugee and professional experience as a scientist and professor. And he will demonstrate as the importance of resilience in human and material world. Relax and enjoy the video. All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, um, my name is Admir Mašić, and I'm a faculty at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. I'm unfortunately not able to join you live to this wonderful summit and um, uh, I'm afraid you will need to write me an email or contact me in other ways uh, to ask questions about uh, my presentation. It's really a great pleasure to be here. I would like to uh, thank organizers uh, for this in inv invitation. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm really glad to, to share this podium uh, with uh, such an incredible uh, lineup of speakers and um, um, I'm I'm gonna share my screen now uh, and my talk um, will be around uh, resilience so share and I will start my presentation so I hope you can see uh, my screen now and uh, yes uh, today uh, I was asked to talk a little bit about resilience uh, in general uh, uh, as a material property, but also um, in humans. Uh, and uh, you will see why of this title, uh, Building Resilience in Humans and Materials. So uh, let's start with the definition uh, in, in our dictionary. So, so resilience is the capacity of a strained body to recover uh, its size and shape after deformation caused in general uh, by compressive stress. So imagine a rubber, uh, you compress it and it returns into original shape. So that's kind of a material science definition. But uh, other uh, definition is uh, um, around the uh, uh, kind of, uh, um, social resilience and adjust easily to misfortune or ch change. Um, in other words, uh, the ability to become strong, healthy, or successful again after something uh, really bad happened. Uh, and uh, I would like to share this image with you. This is uh, where uh, I grew up uh, in Bosnia, uh, Kolibe Gornje, uh, near Bosanski Broad, seven kilometers uh, um, from Bosanski Broad. And as you can see from this picture, uh, there is an uh, um, entire village was destroyed in 1992. And, um, and uh, I, I, I like this picture also uh, because of this house here. Uh, one of these houses shows chimney that uh, stay in general after a, a, a home burns, chimneys stay there. And it's a sign of resiliency. Uh, materials, uh, chimneys are meant to, you know, stand um, uh, uh, the heat uh, and, and temperatures. And, and uh, you will notice that, uh, uh, that interesting phenomenon. In any case, 
uh, uh, so from the material standpoint, the chimneys are resilient to fire. Um, I would like to share also this article at the New York uh, uh, Times uh, in 1992, where uh, you see in July 23rd, the, the exodus uh, resulting from war and suffering in the former Yugoslavia is presenting Europe with its biggest refugee crisis since uh, World War II. So um, a lot of people left uh, their homes. Uh, 2.3 million people have fled from uh, towns and villages. And one of these villages where it was also Kolibe Gornje. And um, the next slide, next image shows, um, you see refugees, uh, unloading some food. Uh, this uh, picture was taken in Croatia, in Kostrena, Rijeka. Um, and uh, if you look carefully at this picture, you will notice uh, a very tall guy, um, extremely tall, tallest uh, guy in the crowd. So uh, is this uh, person here? I don't know if uh, my, um, maybe I'm gonna choose a laser pointer. So this person here is uh, me. If I put, uh, uh, you can see my profile, this Greek profile, you can kind of see it there. And uh, so I was, uh, uh, I ended up in this refugee camp uh, um, and near, near Rijeka, as I said, and um, um, the next picture shows me and my sister together with Italian uh, volunteers that were coming to my uh, camp we lived in these barracks uh, here behind but but you see we we look quite uh, uh, happy in these pictures both I and my little sister Anissa and uh, uh, this is uh, probably because of the Italian volunteers uh, um, that are there uh, and uh, um, they, they would bring a lot of joy to, to us in the camps. Uh, so I'm very thankful to them. And fortunately, uh, even though we are very uh, uh, happy in this uh, image, uh, we actually were not so lucky in the sense that uh, uh, young people in, in refugee camps uh, have limited mobility, um, definitely live under the poverty line and often are dis discriminated uh, and that leads to, to depression. Uh, they are affected by PTSD um, syndrome and also you know, often exposed to criminal elements. There is a risk of radicalization and uh, generally uh, kids are, are, are motivated, uh, but without opportunities. And, and uh, uh, you see, I'm probably happy in this image also because uh, I was allowed to go to school. So in Croatia, uh, in 1992, uh, refugees from Bosnia were not allowed to go to school. And for a series of circumstances that eventually uh, uh, in, you know, included uh, my mom crying uh, in front of uh, uh, director of uh, uh, high school in, in Rijeka and, uh, and me showing my all A certificate, Sve uh, Petice. Um, and uh, and uh, that uh, induced uh, this good man uh, uh, to allow me to, to join the classes in, in, um, in the uh, high school that was for um, basically uh, chemical technicians. And I, I kind of was happy to, to study chemistry because uh, in Bosanski Brod, you will know, there is a big raffinery. And uh, of course, uh, we were sure we are gonna go back soon to, to, to Bosanski Brod. And that's, that basically uh, um, told me that maybe chemistry Will be very useful when we are back, uh, and I could work in in raffineria. So that was uh, the main reason I picked that uh, uh, high school, and uh, um, and also because there were only two options: like uh, 
technical chemistry, chemisko technological school and some communication and transportation high school. And so I picked the uh, chemistry, but uh, incre incredibly uh, for me and for my professors in that school, uh, it turned out that I'm extremely talented to solve chemistry problems. I basically um, worked um, for uh, on, on, you know, typical uh, workload in this high school, but then uh, the same uh, director and was my professor of chemistry, Jelko Gurguric, he, he said like, I mean, maybe you should say, solve these, uh, uh, these set of problems. And I took them back to my refugee camp and, and eventually brought him back solutions. Uh, he was uh, stunned by the fact that I, I did it all right. And, and I mean, I, I, in the refugee camp, really, you don't have too much uh, uh, to do. You play ping pong or solve. <laughs> For me, chemistry problem. So you swim in the, in the sea uh, that was also nearby. But uh, uh, to make this story short, uh, um, I found the talent for chemistry and, and, and Professor Gergoric asked me to join the city competition, little Olympiad of chemistry in Rijeka. I incredibly won that competition. That was an important sign for me to continue studying and, and um, eventually, you know, laws change in Croatia. So I got uh, admitted regularly to the school after a year or two uh, going, being a guest. And, uh, and in the meantime, I basically um, competed even on the national level uh, Olympiads uh, in Croatia and, and uh, participated in the, in the summer schools uh, uh, for young chemists. Uh, One twenty-five best young chemists were invited to, to these schools. So years after year, year after year, I, I basically, um, uh, put a lot of effort and, and work into, into chemistry. And that uh, eventually led me to receive this letter from Open Society uh, Institute in Croatia that basically gave me um, some money. That was $500. It uh, was not bad, especially considering the fact that I lived uh, on $100 per month. Uh, that was kind of my monthly uh, budget and and you know it was like only 25 students that uh, you know got awarded this uh, uh, really uh, got this recognition and and it was it meant a lot for me allowed me then actually to um, uh, translate and and uh, did all this nostrification uh, of my uh, uh, high school diplomas and eventually I uh, ended up studying in uh, um, in uh, uh, Italy. So this is me with a lot of hair. You can notice that uh, uh, with my uh, colleague, uh, um, university colleague, Marco Nicola. And uh, with Marco, I uh, basically uh, become very good friend as, um, you know, um, student pals, but then uh, um, Marco is uh, like third uh, generation of restorers in Italy and his family is very big uh, uh, private restoration uh, family for all things. So this is uh, where basically we st I started to be interested in, uh, in um, uh, cultural heritage, uh, ancient buildings. And with Marco, eventually we started a company that uh, uh, is uh, actually still uh, uh, running. Marco is still running this Adamantio uh, um, in, in Turin. And uh, through Adamantio, uh, we, we worked uh, to help uh, restorers uh, and, uh, um, you know, all the people that uh, uh, protect the heritage and restore um, ancient buildings or work in archaeological sites uh, to basically inform them on materials. And this is an example of our work in, in Vatican, uh, you know, this uh, uh, columnade, uh, this columnade, the Bernini's columnade, uh, uh, we uh, advised uh, on con conservation and, uh, and treatments of these statues on top of the columnade. So here you see better. Anyway, so that's just one example of work. And eventually we worked on, um, on many, many 
all things. And that's uh, how basically I, I got interested and also started to specialize on the resiliency of materials. So how materials degrade, uh, how can we, you know, uh, help them to go back into original uh, um, condition and, uh, um, and yeah, in general, uh, I basically um, spent 11 years in Italy, so did my uh, um, undergraduate studies uh, and, and then the master, got my master degree and, and, uh, uh, and eventually also a PhD while I was working uh, on uh, on these uh, um, ancient materials, and indeed my my PhD is on on the preservation of ancient manuscripts, including these two thousand years old Dead Sea Scrolls uh, uh, that uh, uh, were found uh, um, sixty about sixty seven uh, seventy years ago in um, in the near Dead Sea. So. I'm uh, basically uh, then uh, uh, after Italy, I moved to Germany. I continued uh, working on, on ancient manuscripts and Dead Sea Scrolls. I, I then expanded my work on, uh, on biological materials, uh, including collagen, silk, and others. And, uh, and uh, after working for a few years at Max Planck Institute uh, near Berlin, um, I eventually accepted the position uh, here at MIT and uh, moved to uh, uh, Boston, Massachusetts in um, uh, 2015. And uh, since then, I have been uh, uh, interested in um, world's primary building material. And uh, um, what do you think? What is it? I, I guess uh, uh, many of you will know that the uh, most used material after water is concrete and, and cement production uh, uh, is uh, um, increasing constantly. Now we produce about 4 billion metric co cub cubes of uh, um, metric tons, sorry, um, cubic meters. Uh, uh, of uh, uh, cement uh, uh, per year. And uh, uh, you see, uh, by 2050, every single of us will carry uh, uh, about uh, two tons per, um, uh, two tons of cement per year. And that's a really huge amount also because considering that each ton of, of cement produced will lead to uh, about a ton of CO2 emitted into atmosphere. And uh, that's uh, where this material actually uh, is uh, becoming an evil material when it comes to our sustainability. Uh, and and uh, um, the, indeed, uh, concrete uh, accounts for about 8% of total uh, carbon emissions, um, uh, which is really a huge uh, uh, amount. Uh, um, and we, we need to find a way uh, to reduce this, uh, these emissions. Uh, uh, goal for 2050 is indeed uh, uh, about to, to, to go to zero, like uh, zero net emissions, which is uh, extremely challenging considering that uh, the, the technology we use to produce this uh, uh, material. So, so that's more or less what the um, kind of is a, a key challenge we have in, in my lab here at MIT, uh, how to make uh, this uh, material sustainable and, and um, how to uh, limit its uh, CO2 emissions. So you, you know also probably and recognize this uh, um, incredible uh, disaster that happened um, in 2018 in Italy, uh, Bridge Morandi uh, um, basically uh, collapsed, uh, killing uh, about uh, 43 people. And uh, we don't know yet the real reasons for um, uh, this tragedy, but the bridge suffered from major damage. 
load bearing structural elements and poor maintenance and and you know um, when you see these disasters uh, um, and then that you see these bridges here this is a roman aqueduct uh, in france that was built uh, uh, you know 2000 years ago uh, and and still uh, being used and you see people here walking on on it uh, and and you you ask yourself why our bridges uh, you know uh, collapse uh, uh, after a few years, 50 years, uh, uh, and then we have uh, uh, materials, you know, the best example is Pantheon uh, uh, for Roman technology that uh, in concrete, this, this building is entirely uh, made out of concrete, um, uh, and lasts for, you know, 2000 years. And uh, uh, that's something that uh, we uh, have been uh, um, working on uh, in um, in my lab, uh, trying to uh, understand uh, uh, the durability of ancient Roman concrete, and indeed, uh, ancient Roman concrete is an uh, incredible material. Not only has a proven durability, uh, often uh, uses recycled materials. So imagine if we, in our concrete, uh, use recycled materials that uh, uh, eventually will significantly reduce. Uh, the emissions uh, and uh, even uh, from the very energy standpoint uh, the uh, the roman concrete the uh, ancient roman concrete requires less energy uh, and leads to the very similar chemistry uh, compared to our ordinary confined uh, cement so so this uh, more or less uh, is uh, uh, now basically uh, the uh, an example of this concept that we uh, we uh, like to talk about, uh, we, we talk about antiquity inspired uh, uh, materials design, we indeed explore ancient technologies in the past uh, uh, for a sustainable future. So uh, we, we believe uh, firmly that uh, there are some materials that we should look uh, uh, into from our uh, uh, past that uh, might uh, uh, show properties that eventually uh, will allow us to design and build a, a better future compared to materials we are using after um, industrial revolution. And what we do is, uh, so we find these ancient samples, marvels, and uh, uh, we um, basically um, use uh, characterization tools to, to uncover um, properties and, and then uh, uh, these uh, um, characteristics uh, we try to translate into a new modern materials. Here is an example of ancient Roman concrete uh, that was imaged uh, using uh, uh, instruments we have in our labs here. Uh, so this is uh, basically uh, an entire map of elements. You see silicon, sulfur, potassium, calcium, magnesium on, on a chunk of uh, Roman concrete that this is actually one, one centimeter, one and a half centimeters big. So, uh, um, and, uh, and half a centimeter in height. So it's a huge image and it contains a lot of a lot of information you see this is a zoom in uh, and each of these granules actually here are nanometer scale granules that uh, you see we can clearly characterize from the chemical standpoint so uh, now that the, basically we uh, kind of understand the, the structure from macroscopic to nanoscopic scale we, we try to translate some of these uh, properties into modern materials. So I want to stress here that we are not reproducing exactly the Roman uh, technology, but we are uh, um, extracting the properties that uh, are of interest, you know, and in this uh, specific case, the resiliency of Roman concrete and the durability is a property we want to understand and, and translate into our modern uh, construction. And, and uh, when it comes to Roman concrete, you will see that it, it self heals. And uh, uh, this self healing property is due to a specific way how, how we mixed, 
how Romans mix the, uh, uh, um, their, their concretes and, and eventually leads to um, inclusions at the, uh, uh, our source uh, of self-healing. And this is what we translated into into modern. Uh, the cool about ancient world is that there are many other materials that we, we can look into. So Egyptian blue, Mayan blue, I mentioned to you Dead Sea Scrolls and, and it's really fascinating to, uh, uh, to use uh, advanced characterization tools and, uh, and um, you know, understand these uh, ancient marvels and, and use that knowledge to then uh, inspire our future. I, I think the concept is really, really, uh, neat. Uh, students, of course, appreciate very much this, and I take my students to Italy every year. Unfortunately, due to COVID, uh, we couldn't go uh, past two years, but I hope we will re restart this, and we visit Pompeii, Rome, uh, Turin, uh, and uh, many other places, uh, and, and explore ancient technologies through this uh, summer school that then leads to a class in the, at MIT. Uh, you see, uh, I mentioned to you translation, we, we in, in the specific case of Roman concrete, uh, we filled the patent application that was accepted and now we have a startup, DMAT, Performance Matters, uh, um, complex science, simple ingredients uh, uh, startup in Italy that uh, you can look into that will uh, eventually um, translate in, in, in practice uh, this uh, concept of self-healing, uh, um, uh, Roman-inspired self-healing of material. Uh, um, but when I moved to MIT, I also saw these pictures here. It was the time, 2015, when Syrian uh, refugee crisis was uh, really uh, rocking the world. And, and uh, now if we look at the uh, current situation with refugees, there is really uh, more than 79 million uh, refugees and uh, forcibly displaced uh, people around the world. So it's a big country, you know, of refugees out there um, stranded somewhere. And, and uh, only 3% of refugees uh, uh, go to university, which is uh, very little compared to 34% uh, globally. And uh, of course, there are many talented uh, refugees and um, uh, unfortunately have little opportunities to express that talent. Um, I mentioned uh, uh, depression is, is quite typical for refugees. I felt that uh, and PTSD. Um, so these numbers are now 50% uh, uh, depression and 80% and with PTSD are Syrian refugees in Jordan. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, MOOCs for this category, MOOCs are these massive online uh, open courses uh, um, that you get online are generally not, not great and uh, uh, not useful, not helping refugees. And, you know, education, unfortunately, is uh, um, costly, but also uh, rarely uh, leads to employment opportunities. So, so there are many issues uh, when, when you think about refugees and, um, and uh, education. So that somehow um, started to uh, let me think that I might uh, uh, find some of the solutions and resources uh, and, and see how we can educate uh, uh, displaced in a sense, how can we bring educational tools to such a difficult uh, group of people. Um, and uh, and uh, indeed, uh, I um, wrote this article um, a few years ago, you see in 2016, already five years ago, wow, uh, time is flying. Uh, but, um, but then uh, um, I basically, um, came up in this, uh, in this article, uh, I concluded that it is important to give all students, regardless of background opportunities to learn and apply their talents to build a better world. I, I believe that this is really essential uh, to give everyone opportunity. Now, if they are gonna take it or not, that's not our problem, but I think the problem uh, um, is that there are really uh, little opportunities to help uh, to, 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 for refugees to, to enter 
the um, you know higher education um, pathways. And this is uh, where React uh, uh, is born. Refugee Action Hub uh, started in 2017 here at MIT, and since then we have been uh, working on uh, accelerating pioneers uh, through agile continuous education, opening uh, opportunities for these rising stars uh, to, to be successful and, uh, and bring the positive change in their careers and their communities. And, and we are building constantly new tracks. We have computer and data science certified program, Meti Micromasters and entrepreneurship and innovation leadership. Bootcamp. Uh, so um, uh, what we do is uh, we combine actually MOOCs uh, uh, with uh, human skill development, uh, workshops, uh, and uh, uh, employment pathways uh, um, through paid internships and uh, other, uh, you know, uh, experience-based uh, 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 learning uh, that then leads to employment. And of course, key for us is uh, uh, our networks and the con con we connect our students with mentors peers, companies, NGOs, and universities um, that are connected with MIT React. And, uh, and we are uh, powered by a connected network of global hubs. Uh, currently uh, on the left, uh, we have uh, Jordan, Uganda, United States, Colombia, Uruguay, and Greece. Uh, we are working on uh, um, uh, hubs in, uh, in, in, in Turkey, Lebanon, Ethiopia, South Africa, Kenya, Italy. You see, we have uh, um, we are covering slowly but surely entire world because we our our programs are um, in general uh, delivered online and uh, and uh, um, we 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 are able to reach uh, students anywhere in the world. So we admit the, really the top talent to our programs. Uh, Seven percent admission rate is something comparable to MIT admission rate. So. This uh, year, I just closed, uh, we just closed uh, um, another round uh, and the cohort of 2022, uh, we received uh, more than 3000 applications from all around the world and, uh, and we will be admitting 110 uh, students. We just admitted 110 students. Uh, on top of these 110 students, uh, we are gonna admit 25 students from Afghanistan that is, uh, Fortunately, you know, very uh, current, uh, um, currently, uh, let's say that currently we have that issue uh, of um, uh, people forced to uh, leave Afghanistan. So we, we have uh, incredible numbers of our students that completed programs, 88% uh, completion rate, the average grade of uh, also 90%. And uh, students come from 22 countries, uh, um, from high school graduates to advanced degree seekers. Uh, um, they are really incredible, um, um, you know, individuals and uh, making ventures, uh, uh, building companies. You see, 75 percent of alumni are considering entrepreneurial ventures. So keep eye on these uh, individuals. Uh, here, here is uh, Farzad, lives in Greece. He he is very uh, has very entrepreneurial mind, and he he's gonna start uh, his new startup very very soon. Uh, uh, here is uh, um, Fatima that uh, ended up uh, doing her PhD at Rice University here in the States, and um, Jessinga. She's Congolese refugee in uh, Kenya uh, that uh, I will be meeting in a few days, uh, which I'm very excited about it. Uh, so Jesse is a leading youth advocate for refugee and the vulnerable population and now serves on the MIT React Admission Committee, but also she started uh, a center in, in Kakuma refugee camp in Kenya. So uh, my time is uh, uh, up, unfortunately, already. So I need to wrap up this uh, presentation. And uh, if you see this picture, uh, I picked her it because it does uh, reflect uh, refugees you see moving about uh, imprinted into concrete. So somehow reassumes uh, 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 this presentation. 
uh, but uh, in in uh, my life, uh, 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 you know, in my life, uh, I firsthand experienced uh, uh, the difficulty of being displaced and being refugee, and uh, I also, uh, you know, um, uh, understood the the importance of resilience, um, especially in humans. <laughs> And, uh, and uh, I think uh, um, the example of my uh, life and, and uh, this example of, of React shows an important uh, uh, importance of resilience, but also importance uh, of opportunities. And uh, I work in the educational uh, you know, domain of uh, opportunities and bring educational uh, tools uh, to refugees. But I think in general, uh, the key is really to give an opportunity to these individuals that are unlucky just because they were forced to leave their home. And, uh, and uh, uh, I really believe that uh, um, the talent is ubiquitous uh, and, uh, and, uh, and we need to allow that talent to emerge. Um, I, I, I will close with this uh, African proverb that it says, uh, if you want to go fast, go alone. And if you want to go far, go together. So I invite you to join me to go together and uh, go very far um, together. So um, thank you very much for this opportunity uh, to um, share my uh, experience and my work with you. And uh, I'm very much looking forward to um, uh, working and walking uh, together with you and we are going to go far, far together. Thank you very much.